Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and Happy New Year to everybody. I hope you had a wonderful holiday and stayed with your excellent habits, both diet and exercise, and you're ready for a fabulous 2014. I will start with just a couple of announcements. Uh, first of all, school starts next week at the Wellness Farm Institute and we're offering some wonderful classes, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, women's health, plant-based nutrition and health, institutional food management from a healthy perspective, um, medical nutrition therapy and meal planning, lots of great stuff. So if you're planning to enroll in school, this is the week to do it. And then a couple of things coming up on our schedule. Uh, Saturday, January 11th this week, advanced study with me. We're gonna take um, the first two hours and uh, of this uh, session and um, really take an in-depth look at Whole, Dr. Colin Campbell's book, and then in February we'll do another two-hour session on the book. So if you want to register for that, call our office. And then our first Conversations with Chef Dell program is scheduled for January 16th. He's going to talk about winter soups and stews. I don't know about you guys, but we are freezing our butts off here. So if you're cold like we are, this is the season for these kinds of foods. All right, so let's get into some news. Lots of stuff to talk about in the new year. And um, I'm really excited to report on this study about vitamin D. As many of you know who've listened to me for a long time, I've been cautioning against uh, taking vitamin D supplementation and, and basically saying that this vitamin D thing has just turned into a big industry and most of it is not worthwhile. So let me just tell you about this. According to a large meta-analysis, low blood levels of vitamin D are most likely a result of many illnesses, not the cause of them, and supplementation doesn't help in treating these conditions. Now this was a big study, 290 prospective cohort studies and 172 randomized controlled trials. Analysis of the cohort studies showed an association between lower vitamin D levels and conditions all kinds of conditions like infectious disease, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, weight gain, multiple sclerosis, declining cognitive function, impaired physical function, mood disorders, and all-cause mortality. But an analysis of the randomized trials, which included the 34 intervention studies in which patients with low vitamin D levels were given supplementation, showed no effect. And here's a quote from the authors. The discrepancy between observational and interventional studies suggests that low vitamin D is a marker of ill health. They further stated that the mechanism that causes lower vitamin D levels is most likely disease-related inflammation, and this is why we see low vitamin D levels associated with such a wide range of disorders. They concluded by advising against supplementation with vitamin D. Part of the review involved analyzing studies that investigated the effect of vitamin D levels on A1C level, uh, C1 levels in diabetics. In 16 trials, vitamin D supplementation did not show any improvement. And two large trials showed no reduced risk of cancers with supplementation. The exception was elderly people, uh, mostly women, who had a slightly decreased risk of all-cause mortality as a result of taking supplementation. And here's the problem with vitamin D and so many other issues. I think most healthcare professionals would agree that certain populations, such as the very elderly who never get any sunlight, people who are in kidney failure, these types of populations benefit from supplementation with vitamin D, but this just does not translate to a recommendation for the general population. Now, it's not gonna change anything, I hate to tell you this, but health professionals are gonna to continue to misinterpret blood test results and tell people who have perfectly normal levels of vitamin D that they're low and they should take supplementation and to insist that taking vitamin D is a way to prevent, stop, and reverse disease, and it is not. But anyway, those are the results of a large meta-analysis. I'm proud of myself. I've been writing about this for 10 years and more and more studies are proving me right. The other thing I want to talk about is Obamacare. I get a lot of emails from people asking what to do, people being thrown off their plans, people who are changing healthcare providers. There's a lot going on. And almost every day last year brought some bad news concerning the Affordable Care Act. But here's the deal, it's the law of the land. We're gonna to have to live with it at least for a while. Some of the concerns are things like high deductibles and high premiums, which have been imposed in order to take care of older and sicker people. Can't do much about the premiums, but we can do a lot within the realm of the deductibles. Now, the number one tool for surviving all these changes in healthcare 
is to achieve and maintain optimal health and to learn to just say no when your insurance companies and health providers encourage you to get useless and harmful tests. Now, I make it a point to stay away from doctors, so I don't have to get into these arguments every day about what I am going to do and not going to do, but I get these little friendly reminders in the mail, just like you do, encouraging me to get all kinds of tests because I've reached a certain age and that sort of thing. I throw them away. Now, the temptation is that because all this stuff is now theoretically free, and I think you guys know there's no such thing as free medical care. That's one of the reasons all the premiums are going up. It isn't free. But in any case, it, it increases the likelihood that some people will be tempted to say, oh, since it's free, I might as well just go do it. I've had a few people tell me over the holiday that that's how they got sucked into getting some tests done, and now they're dealing with what they should do about the results. Are they clinically significant, etc.? So anyway, learn to just say no when you get these notices in the mail and if you still are regularly seeing doctors, free doesn't necessarily mean it's a good idea. Now there is a silver lining in the disaster that's the law and it's mostly due to the high deductibles, which means that consumers are gonna be paying out of pocket for a lot of expenses. Um, and in response to this, a couple things. First of all, consumers will be much more conscious of both the price and the quality of service. The other thing, medical facilities are starting to post their prices and advertise that they're offering things for less. For example, the Surgery Center of Oklahoma has posted its costs online and lists um, hernia repair at $3,975 and gallbladder removal at $3,200. By comparison, other competitors in the area are charging $17,200 for the hernia repair and $24,000 for gallbladder removal. According to an article in the New York Times, people are traveling from other states to come to this particular surgery center because of the lower prices. So I think that this is the way markets should work. And I think that over time, um, people who deliver and organizations that deliver really good services at good prices are going to capture the market. And you should support that type of thing. And it will also keep you from paying too much. Companies facing, high, uh, facing higher premiums are choosing to become self-insured, which is a great idea, and a whole industry is building around negotiating lower rates for things. For example, one third-party administrator was able to reduce costs for dialysis for their self-insured clients from $10,000 per visit to $975. So indirectly, even though I still think this law is a disaster in many, many respects, there are many ways that consumers can make it work for them. Last year I covered in some detail Martin Goldhill's excellent book, Catastrophic Care, in which he explained how much better the healthcare system works when individuals contract for healthcare. Again, more conscious of the price, the quality, make sure that you pay attention to those sorts of things. And then last but not least, I'll encourage you to consider concierge care, which is to contract with a doc outside the reimbursement system. Now, a lot of people think that this is really pricey, and when it was first introduced, it was. People would pay ten, twenty thousand dollars to, you know, get special care from a doctor. But a lot of docs are now catering to the middle class for rates that are very, very low. Uh, much less than your deductible is going to be on a lot of these plans. And there are a couple of benefits. First of all, doctors who are outside the reimbursement system are not getting friendly little visits from government officials and insurance companies asking why they're not doing more tests and, and uh, practicing according to plan. And these doctors do not have to report anything about your health status or treatment to anybody, including the federal government, um, which I think has proven to be a little untrustworthy. I don't know about you, I'm not crazy about my medical history being transmitted to the government under any circumstances. So um, we can hope that parts of this law will never be implemented and might be modified and all that sort of thing, but hopefully these tips will help you to live with it within today's framework, um, since we all have to do that to some extent. Okay, so that's all for today. I will be back again on Thursday, and as usual, feel free to pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it. Have a great day.